you know, maybe there'll be a time where it's like, okay, Andy's also the first person to ever do this. I'm like, stop giving her firsts. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if, what is it? If you ain't first, you're last. A little yeah, Talladega nice yeah, for you there. Yeah, there you go. By the way, I want you to know, what are you at? Yeah. So we had a guy from Newfoundland who was one of our runners during the Olympics and he taught me that. So when you said that, I was like, aha, I actually do know what yeah, that yeah, means. Yeah. Another episode here of Toba Tonight, joined by the great Andy Petrillo. Andy, did I say that last part right? You actually did. You nailed it. You awesome. nailed the last name. I have been practicing <laughs> that since I was 12. No, I'm like, <laughs> I would see you come up on the screen for like Hockey Night in Canada, and then someone would be like, Go ahead, Brian, say your last name. I'm like, You guys are such jerks. I'm like, a Petrangelo, a Petri. And then they were just they're like, uh, see, you don't know what I'm like. One day, guys. One, one day. day you'll get. Well, <laughs> I take solace in knowing that at least when people see my name, they have a better chance at pronouncing it than looking at Carlo Koliakovo's last name and attempting yeah. that one. So mine's I, a little true. bit easier. Yeah. I feel like there are certain names out <laughs> there. His is one. And I remember Petrangelo's another one trying to explain that to like a 10 year old playing like NHL 22 mm. franchise mode. You need to get Andy Petrangelo. He's yeah. like Pietrangelo. He's, That's how yeah. with the Italian. Yeah. Rrr, I, Pietrangelo. I, I just I, I just forget. <laughs> I'm just like just just get him or all right, try to sign Shea Theodore. We either one of those. It's like <laughs> a name exactly. that you can pronounce great. <laughs> uh I want to ask you because kind of talking a little bit about the name side of things. Hmm. Uh I remember, I don't know if you said this on air or if it was like in a, a book, or I believe you said it dealing with Bob Cole, but I thought it was interesting because I'm a fellow Newfie and I know there are people out there like, you don't say Newfie. I'm like, listen, as a Newfie, I feel like I can get away with saying Newfie. There, but, there you go. <laughs> um, it was like you mentioned at one point you went down, and this is, I guess, when you were first kind of starting off with Hockey Night. You were trying to, you know, pronounce people's names, get their names mm -hmm. right. And I think Bob Cole either like took you aside and said, hey, you have to say it the same way I say it. And, I, and I'm and i sitting there. And I think you may have mentioned this on Overdrive. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, Why? Like, I, I get people like Bob Cole. It's nothing as slander against Bob. But I'm like, she's trying hard to get these people's names right. And just because you don't know how to say Gianta doesn't mean that she can't learn how to say Gianta. But, like, how did you feel at that? Because you're just starting in the door. Are you taking his advice and going, like, okay? Or are you kind of telling Bob, like, I'm trying to learn these names. Can you try to learn them with me? Yeah. No, you know what? I will say he said it, he said it in actually in a very kind way. Yeah. Um, but he wanted to make sure, and this is something that is still the same, like even till this day in my career, it never goes away. And that is trying to get the, like trying to pronounce the best of your ability people's names because some of them are difficult. And with your broadcast partners, if we're going to agree on a name, then it needs to be said that way by all of us, right? Like, yeah. so for example, um, you know, somebody I can think of would be the speed skater, Charles Amelin. He wants to be known as Charles Amelin. So as long as we are across the board saying his name that way, then we're golden. But if I say Charles Amelin and then I throw to my co-host and he goes, Charles Hamlin, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it, it can throw people. Everyone's like, why is she saying it one way? Why is he saying it another? It is so like, the pronunciation of names is so important because it's somebody's name. But man, oh man, can it ever be the bane of your existence too if it's difficult to pronounce. So I actually appreciated when Bob Cole, um, he pulled me aside and he said, all right, just so you know, this is how I say their names. And yeah. if you happen to interview them or if you happen to mention them in a story, make sure you say it this way as well. And I'll give a lot of play-by-play -play guys credit they speak to the athletes, a lot of them, like whenever they can, they get that FaceTime. Uh, I know guys who actually have recording devices and they will get each player yeah. to pronounce their names because they're the play-by-play -play guys. They're always saying their name. So they try to get it right all the time. I know at Loyalist when we were doing like, so we did the Belleville Bulls, that's what they made us do. Mm -hmm. And some of the athletes, I guess it's the way you present it, but some of the athletes were like, am I going to jail? Because I'd be like, all right, before we do this interview, like name, number. <laughs> And can you turn this way? And can you turn yeah, that yeah. way? <laughs> they just, it's like Jordan Subban just looks at you like, you know, PK, right? And I'm like, yeah, but this is just so I can go back to the teacher and say, I've actually done this. Like, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, it, and it's, it helps you because 
listen, athletes, you know, they don't realize it, but some, some athletes actually will change their name as well in a course of a year. And you're like, wait a second. And then you get it as the reporter, play by play, whatever. Oh, you're, you're pronouncing the, the person's name wrong. It's like, wait a second. Right. So sometimes you can hold athletes accountable where you say, yeah. hey, you told me this is how you pronounce it. And I get it because a lot of the athletes, too. Um, and this is funny because some of them will just say, hey, call me this. So uh, I remember uh, Chris Versteeg was a good one. So he came on over the Toronto Maple Leafs. He had always been known as Chris Versteeg. He won yeah. a Stanley Cup with the Chicago Blackhawks as Chris Versteeg. Yeah. Suddenly he walks in. He's like, everyone now I am Christopher Versteeg. Not a big deal. I mean, his full name's Christopher. But it was, he was adamant. And finally, one day I just said to him, like, why are you changing it? You've been in the league for years. And he goes, well, now I'm in a bigger market, right? He was in Toronto. And he goes, and now my mom was upset because she gave me the name Christopher. And she okay. didn't like that people were shortening to Chris. And I said, I can appreciate that, Mama Versteeg. But you can't really expect people where you're now towards the end of your career. Everyone's always known yeah. you as Chris Versteeg. I, like, Christopher Versteeg just didn't roll off the tongue. So a lot of players... They'll change their name, A, because they're scared to tell you how to properly pronounce it if they're not North American. And then later in their careers, right, they get a little bit more emboldened. They say, actually, this is how you properly say it in, you know, Russian, Slovakian, whatever. Uh, and then there are other players who said, well, my mom said that you actually have to <laughs> pronounce here, it this here way. Here she is on the phone. You explain why. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, the, okay. <laughs> the one that I think of when you mentioned, of course, like if they're not from North America is like Patrick Laine. And it's like, mm. he comes, I think he came out and said, it's like Lane. And I was just like, how do we go through the world juniors and no, no like offense to like Gord Miller or Ray, but it's like, yeah. how do you go through a world juniors and then go to the NHL? And at no point when TSN interviews you, Sportsnet, all these places, do you go like, hold up a second. This is the third time. Can you just get it correct? Like, it's not hard. Mm. It's not like it's like vowels missing. Just let them know it's Lane. A lot of the, but that's the thing, right? A lot of these yeah. athletes, when you say, how do you want your name pronounced? They go, ah, whatever. And you oh, say, well, no, 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 but how, yeah, like, you, but you say like, how do you want it pronounced? And they'll be like, uh, and, and then you'll say to them, is it this way? And they'll go, yeah, 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 yeah it's that way. It's that way. Yeah, and then fair. five years down the road, eh, it never was that way. Well, um, so yeah, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of times, right? The, they're young. They don't yeah. want to correct you. And it's yeah. not that I'm trying to point fingers or, or put it no, on the no, athlete, no. but like oftentimes it is, it's they're young. They don't want to ruffle feathers. They don't want to bother anyone. We all know that hockey culture, right? Don't, don't speak at a line. Don't yeah. say anything. Don't upset anybody. You want everyone <laughs> to love you. Um, and then afterwards you find out that you're like, wow, so that's actually how you say your name. And let's also just kind of call a spade a spade. The bottom line is, is we're in North America. So a lot of names will get anglicized. If we, try to pronounce every single name the way it's supposed yeah. to be for example my last name if you were to truly give it the italian pron uh, pronunciation it's petrillo am i honestly gonna go on air every <laughs> single day and be like welcome to the show i'm andy petrillo no you're not so of yeah. course you're gonna anglicize things as well right i think it's funny because like to kind of go like after this to go into like a different topic just because it's funny to me like we could have done this for like 50 minutes but like <laughs> i I, I, I yeah i find like when someone gets drafted to Montreal, like we had Michael Ryder, but it was not Michael Ryder. It was Miguel Ryder. And I was like, I oh, wonder how he takes that when he comes home and there's like someone in Newfoundland going like, hey, look, it's no longer Michael Ryder. It's Miguel Ryder. He's like, stop it. Stop <laughs> it. I'm from Bonavista. Or the case when I get someone who calls me from like a bank, they'll be like, is it Tobin or Tobin? I'm like, I like that you want to try oh. to make it French, but I'm like, I, I'm not. I'm from Newfoundland. But if there's a part yeah. of me that's like, oh, next time I go to Ottawa, Tobin. And they'd be you, like, ooh. I, it does like, sound yeah. a little more prestigious. It yeah. does. And yeah. they'd be like, talk French to us. I'd be like, all right, it's Tobin. God. Yeah. <laughs> you get found out pretty yeah. quickly. Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask you, like, you recently just had a birthday. So happy birthday. I did. Thank you. Uh, what did, uh, what kind of events did you do during this birthday? Keep it PG. No. <laughs> oh, I worked. Honestly, uh, let me tell you how sad my life is now. It was, <laughs> it was fun. Um, so for me, I probably decided in my 20s that I was no longer going to have a birthday. I was going to have a birth week. So We're my celebration. Was, yes. Because, and, and it wasn't me trying to be a diva, okay, maybe just a little bit. But it just so happened that my birthday, oftentimes, not, not this year, but oftentimes my birthday would always fall around the Easter weekend. 
Okay. So I would either, you know, do something with my friends and then we would inevitably get together with family for Easter, but then it would also turn into a birthday celebration because I didn't have a chance to see them. And then there'd be like another set, you know what I mean? Like it was always something that got extended because oftentimes it would fall on the Easter weekend. And I just said, meh, just make it a week. So that's what I did. I took off to the spa for a couple days, uh, which was very lovely, all on my own and just chilled and relaxed um, and spent hours at a time uh, getting treatments. Came back home, had to work through my birthday. And actually, my birthday, which is April 9th on the Saturday, I was working downtown at CBC. And I can't remember, honestly, even pre-COVID, the amount of people on the streets of Toronto because the Jays game had just ended. Yeah. It was their home opener. It was like 50,000 people. Crazy. The Leafs game was happening that night. So as 50,000 are leaving, 20,000 are coming in. And it was, I, like I said, even pre-COVID, I don't remember. Maybe it had to have been the Raptors parade. Maybe yeah. the, that was the last time I saw that many people out on the street. So, uh, of course, I just hammed it up and pretended everyone was there to just celebrate my birthday. But um, <laughs> that was basically, and then just had lovely dinners with family and uh, friends, which I wasn't able to do on the day of because I was working. So it got extended Jeez. the week. Do you find yourself like more of a, a workaholic or is it more or less like you space it out? Because I know for me, kind of like relating it to to your side of the story here is like, you know, if you work in an office place and they kind of tell you, okay, like a lot of people will take, say, Canada Day off or they'll take yeah. summers off. I'm like, I don't want to take summers off. Not because I don't like summer. It's just more or less like World Juniors is kind mm -hmm. of like my summer or like going to my birthday in October is kind of like, all right, that's where I'll take my week while you're all working. I, that's where I'll enjoy myself. But like some people mm -hmm. like but it's summer, it's nice weather. I'm like, yeah. And it's also long days. And yeah. if, I get a, if I like get off at three or four, I still have plenty of the day left. Like I yeah. don't need to worry about a whole day of just being like, all right, three o'clock now. What'd you do for the rest of the day? Nothing. I wait till three o'clock. Like, yeah, yeah, no, I, I would definitely classify myself as a workaholic, um, even though I left Leafs lunch to quote unquote, lessen my workload that it that does just, just does not exist in my world. It's still been so busy, but I'll try to take my vacations. Usually I take them around events that I know I'm not working. Right. Yeah. So to your point, I don't work world juniors. Um, so oftentimes that'll probably be like when I'll take my vacation and I'll, and I'll go somewhere. But you know, and then but really, I'm working a ton in the winter. Um, in the summer with CBC, we have a lot of world championship coverage, you know, so I have to do that. It just, it's really hit and miss. Um, but I definitely, I mean, there are things that are planned around my work schedule because if I'm the host for certain yeah. events, like, you know, we just did, um, you know, a whole, um, a whole round of World Cup qualifying for the men. I have to be there for every single game. There's no such thing as I'm going to go on vacation. Someone else is going to host that game tonight. It's like, no, no, no. You are the host of the World Cup qualifier. So you have to continue doing them. Um, so, yeah, but I'm definitely a, a workaholic. I'm learning as I'm getting older. It's not easy. A lot of people no. mastered this a lot younger than me. Um, but I'm learning now in my 40s to finally say no, because it can become very overwhelming. Uh, because I think in the beginning of my career, and then also, let's just be honest, if anyone's interested in getting into this industry too, right? A lot of us are freelancers. You're really scared to say no because you don't think the work's going to be there. When you're young, you want to take everything on because you want to prove yourself. And then just even when you're somewhat established, again, as a freelancer, you just don't want to say no because yeah. you're scared if you do, that'll give you a reputation. And then maybe that producer, the, you know, that network won't call you again. Um, and it can really do a number on you. It can really burn you out. That's nobody's fault but my own right and in, in, in doing that so now i'm i'm slowly learning to say my time is my time i need to space it out and yes i might have two hours where i'm doing nothing but that two hours is where i literally need to do nothing maybe just read a book or space out like i still need that for my peace of mind so i'm learning to do that as i get a little bit older yeah i i like where you want kind of went into this uh, with that answer, because I wanted to mention to you when you left Leafs lunch, and I remember reading like the kind of press release for it. I was like, all right, my first main concern was like, I really hope she's not burnt out or like, mm. I hope it's nothing serious. But then there's a part of me and I say this jokingly where it was like, I see you on CBC the next minute. I'm like, oh, look at this. Look at this girl. She got two contracts. She was doing <laughs> Leafs lunch and CBC. Who does that? How does it even fly? 
I'm like, because I've never seen someone be on CBC and TSN. Yeah. And I remember watching Overdrive and there'd be days that you would fill in. I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, who's she kidding? It was like, yeah, <laughs> she needed a break, a break from watch. She's back again. And then, and then there, I know. Would be, there would be people on Twitter being like, it's like, oh, was like Andy Petrillo's back. Is she doing Leaf's Lunch? I'm like, no, she crushed my heart on that one. <laughs> <laughs> like, because that's what I would listen to at night. Like, obviously, you change with the year. Or sometimes you just kind of space in and out of things. I know with podcasting, people sometimes listen to these episodes, and then sometimes mm. they don't like the person. Sometimes they don't like me, and then mm. they just go elsewhere. But that's how I would go to sleep at night. I would listen to Leafs Lunch and then Overdrive. And then when it was announced that you were not like you were leaving, I was like, "All right, thanks, Andy." Aww. Like that's that's a little less. <sighs> Leaves lunch know. for me. <laughs> I know. Well, see, you you kind of say that in a joking way, but I took I did take that into consideration. It wasn't easy for me to just say, okay, well, I'm gonna leave this and go because you know that, especially radio, you really create a relationship with the listeners. Like, and I and I knew people had a routine, whether I was part of their lunch break. Uh, I know a lot of people would contact me because, you know, depending on their jobs, they were in their cars a lot. Yeah. And Leaf's lunch was what got them through those two hours, and that was their entertainment. So I completely understand how I became a part of people's lives, and it wasn't a very easy decision, you know, to make. And there were a lot of things behind the scenes, and the humming and the hind. Do I stay? Can we do this more? What else can I do? Like, you know, you're you're just trying to fit these pieces of a puzzle together, but it just wasn't, you know, unfortunately yeah. coming together. But clearly, I I did leave on a very good note. I'll be. Yeah hosting overdrive you know later this week as well i've already been on a handful of times um so i i everyone understood the decision that was being made yeah. and uh, that's why i still left you know it was it was a good relationship but i i get you like trust me it was it was not easy for me because i knew that as much as like i asked people to let me into their lives yeah. and they did and yeah. now i was like bye so I, I get that. I get that it was, you know, a bit of a shock to some people. I, I just always felt like, and now this is not to, because people will be like, oh, geez, he has Andy on. He's just kissing ass. It's like, no, it's it's just sincere. Like if I did not like something, I'm sure I would have tweeted at you. I do not like this. And then you would have read it and not reply. <laughs> but like, I just thought it was interesting because I always felt now this is nothing against Sportsnet because I had friends that work at Sportsnet or internship. I just, I grew up on the score. I grew up watching like Cabby. I grew yeah. up seeing that. And then I, as, as like 10 years old, you're like, I like the score. But then when the score kind of got overtaken, I've seen the people go from the score to TSN. And then I kind of watched TSN because Jay and Dan, James mm -hmm. Duthie. But I always felt like the women on TSN, they were getting their chance. Like I just felt like they were getting a little bit more of a shot. And I grew up listening I'm watching Kate Burness. So when you kind of went into that fold, I was like, she is right where she needs to be because at CBC, when it was just the eye desk, I was like, she's the only girl there at the time, like in the studio side. And I'm yeah. like, geez, if we could get her, it was almost like when you're watching like a WWE or an, or an NHL game and you see the guy in the minors and you're like, just give him a shot at the majors. Yeah. And I know CBC is still a major, but I was just like, give her some females that she can kind of go inside with, like she can be a co-host or do things mm -hmm. with. So when I do see you on overdrive or on Leafs lunch and you're interacting with people, I was like, wow, like she's good. She knows her role, but she's also getting these other ladies that are experienced. So it doesn't feel like you were kind of like in a man's cage where it's like, all right, mm -hmm. like who do I associate with here? There's no other women around. <laughs> yeah, no, listen, it's, it's, it's really, it's true. And, and we're seeing obviously more and more women and by no means was I ever uh, the first to knock down uh, on the door. There were so many women who came before who are so incredible. But to your point, I want to say when I joined Hockey Night in Canada, I think I was the fifth woman ever, fifth woman ever to be part of Hockey Night in Canada. And then first ever in studio, um, yeah. you know, to do that. So yeah, I mean that. To, and then to your point, right? So you're kind of few and far between. And even though Cassie Campbell Pascal, you know, was part of Hockey Night in Canada, she was doing a lot of things in Calgary. We're never really together, um, you know, when we were there. And I, I can share a story, um, you know, with you. Just my experience, though, right? With uh, sure. you know, with TSN. And I remember this was when a lot of the turnover was happening, and Rogers had just pur purchased Hockey Night in Canada, and I really wanted to be 
a host, right? I wanted to like, I wanted to be in the trenches. I wanted to do game. I wanted to do pregame, halftime, post game, right? Yeah. Um, and because there are so many jobs that you can have in this industry, you can be a reporter, you can be at the desk reading highlights, right? Or you can be a game host. And I wanted to be a game host. And I found that, the tr- that it was very easy for a lot of networks to put women in the highlight chair. Again, yeah. great. Adam, it, it's a great job. It's not an easy job. Um, because you need to, I mean, reading highlights, everyone thinks is easy. It's not easy. You have to have personality, you have to be engaging and you have to know, you know, something about every single sport that you're doing, but it just wasn't my cup of tea. Cause I felt it was just too easy for networks to transition women into that. I wanted to drive the ship. Yeah. And I do remember I was out of a gig. Like so, so a lot of people forget this, that when the turnover happened with hockey night in Canada, um, I didn't have a job for a while. And then I ended up working at the NHL network for a year. The NHL network relocated to the States. Mm -hmm. Uh, They didn't bring their Canadian hosts with them. So I was out of a job again. In one year, I was out of the job twice. Uh, But I just happened to land on my feet uh, very quickly. I I hustled and I landed on my feet. But this one particular time, I thought I had booted myself out of the industry because I get a call from TSN. Mark Miller at the time, you know, was, was, was the head guy there. And he had asked me, do you want to do right? Sports center. Oh, and I went, okay. oh, I said, no, I said, no, no, no. I, I, I appre- thank you. And like the fact that you're offering me a job when I clearly don't have one <laughs> <laughs> means the world to me, but I don't want to go down that path. I have worked so hard to yeah. be a game host. Like I've worked hard to be the next Ron McClain, the next, you know, James Duthie, Scott Russell, you name it. I'm like, I've been working towards that. I don't want to do this detour now. Yeah. And he goes, fine, I get that. I completely get that. If anything comes up, I'll let you know. And I'll just never forget leaving that meeting <laughs> thinking, did I just shoot myself in the foot? Like, did I just oh, yeah. <laughs> shoot myself out of the industry? Because I said no. But he ended up calling me a couple of weeks later. And he says, I don't have anything full time, but I can give you what you want on a part time basis. And we'll see how it goes from there. And he ended up... Um, that's when I ended up doing the Premier League on TSN because okay. there were days where Luke Wildman was doing play by play for other stuff, had to travel this and he couldn't do weekends because he was doing major league soccer stuff. So then I would go in and I would fill in for him on um, the English Premier League and started doing soccer for TSN. And so that kind of happened in this rollover, um, you know, with the NHL network. So at the time I started doing NHL network and TSN at the same time. So but I stuck to my guns, right? Like I really just wanted to be that that host. And to your point, you know, TSN gave me that gave me that chance. They said, okay, you know, I mean, that's what you want. I hear you. Yeah. And when something came up, they called and and they and um, you know they granted my wish. So I'll, I'll I'll always be grateful for that. That's for sure. I do think it's interesting because when you mentioned, of course, about like earlier about finding the line of saying no and having your own kind of personal space. Like it's kind of interesting. Like when you look at the personalities at TSN and CBC and getting their backstory, like of how they got into the field, like my favorite one, like, cause kind of you told a story. So I'll tell a story that's kind of related mm-hmm. to you is we had James Duthie on a podcast once. This is like way early. And I remember emailing cause they were doing a Carlton game and he was going to do the coin toss. And I emailed mm-hmm. Carlton PR. I was like, Hey, I'm at like loyalist at this time, but I'm going to be there for Carlton because I'm an alumni. And can I interview James Duthie? No, just instant, like, no. And I was like, all right. I was like, I've done a, a few internships at this point. I know what emails you have to do. Like, you know, at bellmedia.ca, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And I was like, worst case scenario comes past postmaster delivery fail. Uh, it didn't. And I was like, all right, that's good. So then I went to the homecoming seeing James and I was like, listen, I was like, I know if you don't have the time, that's fine. I'm here with a microphone. Maybe 10 minutes. Do you got 10 minutes just to do a quick chat? And he's like, sure, I got to sign a few autographs. Then I'll come to you. And then I was like, okay. And I waited like right by him. Almost like I I almost felt like a Newfoundlander version of me is kind of like, you don't do that. He'll find you. But the other part's like, no, he might Hmm. walk away Hmm. and then I'll never find. So Hmm. I ended up doing the interview and I found out then a year later when we actually had him on this podcast of how he got into his job. Mm. And I was like, great, that's an interesting clip. So I posted it on like Twitter, Facebook, whatever, with his permission. And I was like, all right, because I'm still relatively new, it wasn't getting a lot of attention. And then I think you went on overdrive one day and you were telling the other two guys of how James Duthie got into his job. I was like, guys, did you ever know how weird it was that like, you know, did you ever figure out how James Duthie got into his job? Like someone got like, 
pretty much shot. And that's yeah. and I was just like, that was the clip that we used, Andy. Yeah. I was like, what are you doing? And then everyone was like, everyone's like, Andy, you're so good. She found out, and I'm like, and so did I. Like, where's my? Credit? <laughs> but I, but I like how you were mentioning like the hard work side of things because I know you mentioned that you were the first kind of female in studio host with mm-hmm. Hockey Night in Canada. But doing a little bit of research, there's a lot of firsts that you've had, like the first uh, female to host Leafs Lunch or have her own radio sports mm-hmm. talk show. Uh, I believe in 2016, you won a Canada Screen Award, and that was the first time they kind of ever acknowledged a female host for a, a sporting host role. And then in 2022, this year, you've got it for best sports host again. So there's a lot of like firsts mm-hmm. in between there. But the biggest first, I think, that goes a long way for, I guess, women in media or just having someone watch your back is you at 19 went into volunteer at York's Rogers. Yeah. And at the time, I believe maybe it was a few years later, but you worked your way up the rankings and was sports host and producer came. And the executives, I, I, from what I read anyway, is the executives were like, we don't want two females, one doing news, one doing sports. What's yeah. on the go here? I think the girl's name was Lisa McLean Stellick. Lisa McLean, St- Gord Stellick's wife. Yeah. yeah. She, she went to bat for you. And like, that's to me. When I'm younger, when someone goes to bat for me, I'm like, of course, you're going to go back for me because you're my buddy and you're my friend. Why mm-hmm. not? But like in those kind of roles, it's not like she has some leverage, but they could easily say, all right, you're gone, too. We don't want her. We don't want you. So yeah. I know she's a sta- she was the station manager, but someone can still say we're leaning more towards this way. But how big of a role? I know this is kind of going all over the place, but how big of a role was that for you that someone went to bat for you and ended up actually winning that? Because you actually did get to, and that kind of helped your career, obviously. Yeah. Oh, listen, till this day, I mean, Lisa knows that I, I think the world of her. If she doesn't, I hope she does, because I, <laughs> I do. I always mention her, and I always mention that story, because that was also the first time that my gender ever got brought up. Like, I've said this before, yeah. like, I'm, I'm an only child. So my parents, I, I never had, like, it's not like I had a brother where my parents would treat him differently versus me. Like being the only child, it didn't matter, right? Like I did what's considered, you know, feminine things to do. I I did what's considered masculine things to do because I was just, you know, getting it from both sides, right? And my parents never once told me I couldn't be something because I'm a girl or do this because you're a girl or you better act that way because you're a girl. It was never that way. Um, uh, But uh, if anything, maybe it was too much not that way because I do remember my mom one time said, I'm going to send you to modeling school because you need to learn proper etiquette. Look at you just running around like crazy. Uh, And she did. And it didn't work. (laughs) So I was still a little rough around the edges. But um, yeah, so when when Lisa, you know, she had been my station manager for a while at that point because I had been volunteering. I had been doing stuff in news. And when I knew the sports guy was leaving, you know, and I went to her, I, I said, I want this gig and the time is perfect. I'm graduating from university at the exact same time. And she agreed. She goes, yeah, this is perfect and everything. And basically, you know, had, had without, you know, formally offering me the job was saying like the gig's yours. I can't imagine it going to anyone else. And then I'll never forget like a few days later, the look on her face when yeah. she's, when she said, she goes, I, I can't believe that I'm saying this, but I can't offer you the job. She goes, yet, she said, give me time because I'm not giving up on you. She's like, but I've basically been told that they don't want two women at the desk. And I'll never just, I'll never forget thinking, well, what the hell does that have to do with anything? It just never dawned on me. So I'm like, huh, what? Like, I don't understand what that even means, right? You two women at the desk, you see two men at the desk all the time. And then slowly, slowly my wheels were turning and I just went, oh, that is BS. Like that is complete BS. And she knew it too, which is why she... Whatever she said, that is still a mystery to me because I don't know how those meetings went, but she clearly made her yeah. case and said that has to be one of the dumbest things, you know, for not hiring somebody. And they gave me the gig and I never really looked back. I was there for two years before I ended up getting the job with Leafs TV and moved on. But um, of course, like it feels incredible when someone goes to bat for you because they believe in you, which emboldens you obviously a little bit more gives you confidence that you're doing a great job. But it was also, like I said, the first time that I got a taste of you can't have this job because you're a woman. Yeah. And I went, mm-hmm. I don't like that. I feel like, and, and how old were you when this was like, say what, 20, 21, 22. 
Uh, no, I probably would have been about 23, 24. I was just okay. 24 because I was just graduating. Because I did, huh? I did university oh, yeah. and <laughs> college. So I did four <laughs> years of university with two years of college, right? So I, yeah, but I ended up graduating when I was 24. So, so like, yeah. how does how does that make you, and, I, and again, you feel free to answer it whatever way you do or dodge it if you want to. We're not that type of, uh, I'm not a TMZ where it's like, <laughs> but it's like, uh, I remember being 24, 25 and applying to different roles in media and just feeling like the disability side, because I have Sturge Weber, was like, that was what was holding the day, the, the door closed. It's not that I don't have like the education. Mm -hmm. Maybe I didn't have the experience as much, but I did have something. But it was almost like, well, if you don't know about the disability, just ask. It's like, I'm clearly putting it on a piece of paper. I'm mm. not hiding it. But I just felt like kind of like, okay, is media even open for people like myself with disability? Like what's closing the door? So, and I and I, I don't have any clout. I can't go in a room and be like, how dare you? But like, how do you feel at like 24? And this is like your first kind of inkling, like, all right, maybe I'm not going to get places because... Why about there's another woman there? They're not going to want me because they already have their woman. Yeah, well, and and so there. That's another topic, and and you yeah. know, and I'm happy to see that that's changed, right? Because for the longest time, there was always like the token female, and sadly, a lot of women who were the token woman wanted to stay that way and didn't help mm -hmm. other women coming through. And I always say to women, "Do you want to be, you know, the lone token, or do you want to be part of a treasure chest full of gold?" Um, yeah. because I think we all know which one we'd want. And that's why, like, so I, I'm so glad of that whole lone female, take a hike, right? The more the yeah. merrier, everyone come on board. But I think what's important is I've, I've been very lucky to have a good surrounding cast, right? Whether they be my superiors, like somebody who can go into those meeting rooms and speak on my behalf when I was a lot younger, and then also just, you know, my peers. So another, you know, I had a couple incidents. I mean, I'm sure there was way more, but two Right now that's standing, you know, at the top of my head is when I first got my job at Leaves TV and um, I would travel with the team. But I had like I had a great cast like Joe Bowen, Greg Millen, Jim Ralph, Dennis Bayak. These were guys that I traveled yeah. with as well. And, you know, one time, too, we were we were actually at we were in Tampa. So the Leafs were taking on the lightning and we're all it's um, morning practice. So we're all, you know, along the boards. We're all just sitting there. We're all just watching like as one does at morning skate. And this security guy comes and uh, like just makes a beeline to me. I need to see your I need to see your pass. And I'll never forget like Joe Bowen going, well, why are you asking just for her pass? Why don't you need to see the rest of our passes? Yeah. And the guy just kind of, you know, was taken aback. But that was the point. It's like you see men and you see one woman. And that's the one that's the woman you think she doesn't belong because she's a woman. The men, they must belong because they're men watching hockey. But yeah. the woman, nope. So you better check her her media pass and you better check that she has it. So I love like Joe Bowen, I remember kind of gave a little take a hike buddy because this ain't going to end well for you type of thing. Right. And I had a lot of incidents like that. I'd be walking with them down the halls, you know, we'd yeah. be on our way to dressing rooms or whatever, be on our way to do interviews or just, and it, security always stopped me. And one of them would always speak up on my behalf and say, take a hike. Like it is so yeah. obvious that you are stopping yeah. the woman and you're not stopping the men. So, I mean, yeah. I had like little incidents like that throughout the way, but I just had a wonderful group of people that I worked with as well. So that was really helpful. I like though, like when you mentioned, of course, the comment about like, do you want to be the token or do you want to be like, of course, one in the treasure chest kind of, I yeah. guess that was right. But like, I like that there was two stories that come to mind for you that really kind of give you that compliment is when you left Leafs lunch. Now, the, again, I don't have a memory of a fish, but I might not. There's been so many interviews, so kind of cross references. But I remember Tessa Bonome saying, I think it was you that she kind of went to where you said, I'm leaving Leafs lunch. And she wanted to kind of get her foot in the door of how to get into broadcasting. And I think you either kind of gave her a good word of advice or kind of gave her the heads up that you were leaving. And I think that's how she kind of got her foot in the door with where she's to now. But I believe it was in her interview. Again, listen, there's been a lot. Leafs TV, yeah. So when yeah. I left Leafs, Leafs there you TV, go. Yeah, Leafs TV, yeah. Yeah, they were bringing her on board 100%. Yeah. And um, I, that's one thing I have to say I've, I've always taken pride in is I've always left my door open um, for other women to just come and talk to me. Because when I was younger, I remember you know certain women ignoring me. I remember yeah. them feeling threatened. I remember them not wanting to help. Uh, but the feeling that warms me inside and makes me smile are the women who did. Yeah. 
and they will always mean more to me, you know, than, than anything else. And I always want people when they think of me and, and I try my best, you can't please everybody, <laughs> but I, when people think of me, I want them to smile. I want them to say, yeah, she was kind. Yeah. She took the time. Even if it was five minutes, I asked for a piece of advice and she was able to give it right. Because you know, it just, it matters. So that's why I say like, even though I know that there, you don't really forget that feeling of, um, of women who purposely just flushed you because yeah. they felt threatened by you. But more than anything, the warmth I felt of those who helped me, um, just, you know, overpowers that other feeling. And I always said, that's how I want to, you know, make other people feel. And I mean, I'll help anybody. I, it's yeah, not yeah. like, you know, it just only I, women. I, yeah. I right? just knock at the door and be like, you're not a woman. I'd be like, I have high heels on. Does that make me? And she's like, come in. And I'd be like, all no. right. I mean, obviously it's been tougher for women. So we have to call a spade oh, a spade. I, yeah. Yeah. But um, no, I mean, my goodness, I just try to open my door no matter what. Like, that's why I try to make myself available. I get, you know, calls to, to speak to, you know, students at certain universities. And if my schedule permits it, I always try to say yes to that because I know. And, and even now it's so funny um, at one soccer where I also work, one of the guys, one of our play by play guys, uh, Adam Jenkins, who's great, new in the industry and everything, but he's like, you spoke at my class at Ryerson. It's like, I 100% nice. remember that day because I had a chance to interview you and everything. And that made me feel so good because A, I clearly gave him advice that worked <laughs> because look at him thriving in the industry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but now we're working together. So, I mean, yeah. it's it's a small world. So it's pretty cool how that can all come together. I feel like I want people to remember me as, hey, remember that person on the internet that you thought was this? And then they go back <laughs> and then they like actually meet you and they're like, he he's just a lot of he likes to just talk a lot of crap a lot on the internet but then when you meet him in person he's like the kindest person in the world i'd be like yes because then if anything i it's like the andy kaufman approach where it's almost like what you thought wasn't mm -hmm. actually what it was and it was like you you could be at a funeral and be like did you know brian did this this and this secretly and they're like no i didn't it's like well now you do it's like all yeah. right cool i want to uh, ask you of course you know throughout your whole career going from all these different places like what has been almost the highlight for you? Because in my mind, I think it's like, you know, bringing the Stanley Cup to Haiti or like you mm -hmm. seem like a big soccer person, obviously married a soccer player. Uh, but like, I would think that soccer is a big deal. But like in all your career, what would you consider the highlight? This interview, obviously, come on. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I took the words out of my mouth. Give me a oh, second. That's fair. That's fair. Um, <laughs> I, I will say... Uh, Okay, so there's something so special about professional sports. And you're right, when you're covering, you know, an MLS Cup final or Stanley Cup final, and oh, it's the atmosphere, the vibe, knowing how hard, you know, that team has worked to get to where they are. So I never want to take anything away from any other sport. But to me, the highlight of my career, something that is always so near and dear and continues to take my breath away is when I work the Olympics. And my first ever which was Sochi 2014, I, I still don't know how to put into words, seeing everyone from around the world, like everyone from around the world converging in one location and the athletes all wearing their gear and their country cl um, colors, even the journalists. So even though, you know, we're not wearing Team Canada gear, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that we are the broadcaster from Canada because our coats are red and we have the maple leaf. And, you know, the Italian journalists have their blue jackets with, you know, Italia written on it. And that, you know, every you just can tell who is from what country and all the all these nations coming together. And there is such um, a civility about it. If a Canadian won a medal people would be congratulating you just simply because you're a fellow Canadian. So that's yeah. something really special. Um, the Olympics to me is something that always takes my breath away. You know, Olympics is a really big sport, but like, you know, when Canada doesn't do so well, how do you take that? <laughs> well, at the end of the day, I mean, I am Canadian, so I'm cheering for the Canadians, uh, yeah. but we, we definitely stay as objective as possible, you know, on the air. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously it hurts, right? When, when, if Canada doesn't do well, but see, we've been very fortunate where we have exceptional athletes and they've given us incredible storylines every single Olympics. Like I could, I could sit here now and bore you and, and take you through, you know, my audio history of the Olympics since I started covering them in 2014. 
But really, all you have to, I mean, the names like Penny Alexiak, Maggie McNeil, Andre DeGrasse, I mean, these are all names, right, that have become household names because of what they've been able to do at the Olympics. And they brought the country together, the Canadian women in, in, you know, in that soccer gold medal game and what they were able to do. You know, we can go on and on and on, but um, we've, been, we've been pretty blessed in this country to have incredible athletes do amazing things on the world stage. And even if they lose, they do so with grace, they do so with dignity, and they still make this country proud. That's going to do it for this episode of Tobin Tonight. Our thanks to Andy Petrillo for coming on to the show. Remember, you can find past, present, and future episodes on TobinTonight.com, Spotify, and iTunes. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and leave a comment or two. For Tobin and myself, this is Jacob saying thank you for listening and good night.